welcome Darren Kennedy to KevJet the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to be here. This has been a long time in the works. It has been a long time. It's been um, a lot of schedules and uh, emails back and forth, but here we are. Finally, in the new year, it's a good way to start. It is a good way to start. It's season two of KevJet the podcast, who would have thought? Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. You're um, coming to us live from LA. I am, yeah, LA. It's uh, it's it's kind of hard to believe it's winter. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm looking at the window now and it's like clear blue skies as far as the eye can see. I can actually see almost the ocean and I'm in I'm in West Hollywood and now it's chillier. Don't don't get me wrong. It's chillier. It's a, it's about 17 degrees today. I feel really um, bad so... for you. I have frost. I know. <laughs> Look, I want I like leave like people locals from LA are like oh my god like you see people literally wearing like fleece lined and, and Sherpa jackets and stuff and I every time I step out and I only got back the other day I'm like oh my god this is kind of surreal like this is winter this is this is kind of bizarre but anyway <laughs> I'm happy to be here I would think so um we have frost in London and it stayed all day long so that tells you how cold it is so I hear I was just off the uh, off the phone to my my sister who's uh, in Ireland and she was saying it's pretty cold at the moment as well. So um, I'll be seeing it myself in a couple of weeks time. So it's not I'm not escaping completely. <laughs> Lovely. So so let's talk about that. You are from Dublin. Yeah, I was born and raised in Dublin and um, went to university in Dublin and with, with stints in France. Um, I did my. Uh, kind of my Erasmus year in Bordeaux and then when I graduated from college I went and worked in Paris for a year and I did a, a, a graduate program with Tourism Ireland so it's a uh, it's kind of part of this international network of um, Irish businesses with a global footprint and they have uh, there's a, a graduate program which anyone who studies business or languages or whatever tends to apply for I was lucky enough to get a place and uh, went for this job in Paris and got it and Worked and lived there for for a year, and then I kind of never stopped. Really, is that kind of uh, what got you into to fashion? No, no, <laughs> nothing. You think, you think you know, Paris? I know you would think that. You know, I fashion and style and interiors. When I was growing up, it was just something I was naturally inclined in towards and had an interest in and had an eye for. I never once considered that it might be a, a, a career path. Never once. And even when I lived in Paris, I was not on that track at all. It was TV. TV has always been my number one. It's always been my focus since I was about 15 years old. It's always, and broadcasting was always what I was drawn to. And I kind of credit a lot of that to David Attenborough as a kid growing up and watching his TV shows and just being absolutely fascinated. And I guess couple that with when I was younger, I wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, and kind of obsessed with the natural world and animals. And um, when I hit my teenage years, I rapidly realized that that was not going to be a career option for me because the sight of even a raw chicken fillet made me feel faint. <laughs> so so I had to deviate quickly. But yeah, so fashion came along later in life. And it was just kind of, I had been working in television behind the scenes, like learning the ropes. And I was working on these huge shows, which were amazing uh, training grounds. And I remember at the end of one of them, I was like, I, I need a break. I need to just do something for me, like a hobby. So long story short, as I sent myself off to Central St. Martin's in London, did a few courses and everything kind of snowballed. And here we are. There you are. You were presenting on TV. That's That was kind of your main gig, wasn't it? Yeah, it is. And it's still my passion. It's still it's still kind of my North Star in many respects. But I think the world of media and landscape has changed so much. Um, I mean, look what we're doing now. This would never have been possible 20 years ago. And I think the digital and um, the advent of digital and social media and online broadcasting and everything just really uh, flipped the traditional broadcast model on its head. So whilst I trained um, radio was my my first, actually. It's really where I got my flying hours. I used to do a lot of national radio and it was amazing. I had a great mentor. Um, any Irish person listening will will know the name Jerry Ryan, kind of a legendary broadcaster who who took me under his wing and uh, gave me my break. And, and again, I had never studied broadcasting. I'd never done anything in that realm. 
I'd studied languages and business. I just wanted to speak French and go off and, you know, <laughs> and have fun. And, uh, and yeah, so, you know, I think at the time when digital broadcasting and social media and all that kind of came to the fore, I was, it was kind of a, a, a perfect crossroads for me because I was kind of primed for both. Um, and then obviously, you know, there, you know, what I've learned about me is I do need variety in life. And if I was just doing one show five days a week, it would drive me mad. Speaking of variety, at 2019, Dancing with the Stars. Yeah, yeah, God, I was only um, reminiscing about that the other day because the new season started uh, last week. And I had, you know, I got asked, would I be interested in that same year? Because I was always dubious about it, if I'm being honest, ahead of it. I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it because it's a huge commitment. Um, and I just, I it was kind of a fairly new format to me and I was unsure, but then the year it, I did it was, I had just launched my uh, men's grooming brand. And I kind of thought, well, this makes sense. And uh, we sure. were available in retail nationwide. And I thought, well, you know, this is, you know, it's, it's a good, um, it's good profile. And then I did it and I absolutely loved it. It's an amazing experience. And I would say to anybody, anywhere in the world, whoever gets the opportunity to do something like that, to, to grasp it with both, both hands and just do it. Like I was terrified. I'm not a dancer. I've never trained. I'm not like, I'm not a stage school kid at all. Um, and I loved every minute of it. Once I relaxed, once I kind of just, I had to have, I had to sit down with myself before we even went to air and say, Darren, you're like, you need to change how you're approaching this because you're just not going to enjoy it. It seems full on. It is one of the most intense things I've ever done. But, I'm, but a, like an experience I love every second of. It looks it looks like a lot of fun, but it does look full on. And and you see on the morning shows when they speak to, uh, they do their morning interviews. They're just like, oh my gosh, I never expected in a million years that it would that it would entail all of this uh, working out and, mm -hmm. and rehearsals and it's just a 24 hour gig. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, I, you know, I think it, I was, I had done 60 days without a day off of training or, um, a day off full stop at one stage. Like oh it's, goodness. and it's, and they're long days, you know, most days you finish in a pool of your own sweat, you know? So. And that's before the show. <laughs> that's before you'd even get to the weekend when the show would happen. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Tell me about You Are What You Wear. You Are What You Wear. Actually, that was really, that was a show that I did straight after Dancing with the Stars, actually. It was uh, BBC One, prime time. And it was uh, BBC's first foray back into the fashion space since 2005, actually, when Trini and Susanna came off air. Um, and that was a really interesting show. And, you know, what I've learned about me and what I enjoy most about everything that I do is people are at the center of it. It's kind of, you know listening to people, talking to people, maybe helping people just kind of see a different um, a different outlook on their own life. And that's what we did in You You Are What You Wear. And it was helping people, you know, feel good from the inside out. Uh, we filmed that in Manchester. I had, um, when did we do that? Yeah, it was 20, 2019, 2020. And then we were just about to air and COVID hit. So that kind of messed up schedules and messed everything around. But it was a really, really enjoyable experience celebrity mastermind is another so it's like it's totally different tv shows and you're just hitting them all well you know that was an interesting one because i got asked to do that and it, when you do celebrity mastermind it's for charity and i always think when you get when when it's going to benefit a charity it's hard to say no because you just feel really of mean course. So unless I could do it. and also i was like my biggest dilemma was going to be what's my you know what's my specialist subject um and I decided to go with the geisha. My specialist topic was the geisha because I was fascinated and still mildly am fascinated with Japan and everything from uh, from Japanese culture. And I, in the end, actually, I did my thesis at university on the geisha. Um, and I had multiple arguments and battles with my thesis supervisor to give me permission to do it because, you know, to prove that it was relevant to what I was doing and whatnot. But of course, I got my way. And, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm going to do the geisha. I think it's it's kind of random. It's it's narrow enough and random enough to work. And you kind of think, well, at least if I make a complete fool of myself, 
most people don't have like a top notch knowledge of the intricacies <laughs> of vacation. However, I did very well. I was very pleased with myself, but I studied like you, you prep for these things. And again, that was great fun. Film film that actually in Belfast during the pandemic. It was it was very strange, but it was it was a good experience. Wow. And then you moved on to uh, Celebrity Closets from L.A. with Lorraine. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's fun. So that's kind of what I'm working on at the moment. It's one of the projects, at least. And it's uh, getting it's kind of like behind the keyhole into celebrities' homes and wardrobes. And it's really it's very enjoyable because I'm incredibly nosy. <laughs> and uh, it, it's also lovely, though, as well, because people you, when you meet someone in their home, and especially in their closet, you know, you you tend to unlock a different side of someone because most people are quite relaxed when they're at home. Um, and it's really a, a trip down memory lane via iconic moments of someone's wardrobe. And, you know, I'm even I even love to see how it's organized, you know, what the thinking behind where things are, what they what's prioritized by this person. You know, is it like, are all the handbags up on the top shelf or, all, you know, it's just fun. And then you open things and then, you know, oftentimes these closets are huge and you snoop about and they're discovering things that they kind of forgot as much as, as you know, I'm discovering things that I never knew they had. So I even remember with Nicole Scherzinger, we opened this gorgeous little Jacquemus bag and inside there was a pair of earrings in it that she didn't even realize were there. So it's like, oh, was it a ring? No, it was a ring. It was a ring that was part of the bag. Anyway, it's uh, it's it's great fun. Who was your favorite closet? You know, I loved, I love Nicole. I love Nicole because I just love Nicole Scherzinger. Um, and she's great fun and she's very authentic individual. She works very hard and she has very um, humble roots and she's never lost sight of that. And I, I uh, you know, I admire that. Nice. Does she have your favorite closet? Is she the most organized? <laughs> Yeah, it was very organized, very well laid out. It was a beautiful closet, yeah. <laughs> I mean, not that I want to, you know, I, I, it's funny, people slag me going, I, I'm going back into the closet. Obviously, that's not the case. But yeah, it's funny. It's funny. I lost in these closets. You got to be careful. I get made fun of for uh, having my closet color coordinated and things organized by length. People make fun of me for that. I mean, I, that's, I want that, but I don't have the patience to do it. So unless like I would gladly let someone do it and maintain it for me, but unfortunately that is not um not uh, a runner at the moment. <laughs> My mom comes to visit and she'll move something on purpose and it she just waits to see how long it takes me to figure it out. And as soon as I walk into my room, I know something's been moved. And you can spot it. I do have color coordinated book color coordinated bookshelves. So oh, I like that. Bring as well. me yeah, it's just lovely bursts of color. Love that. Let's move on to your podcast that you have, which is Numbers. I'm sorry, my dogs yeah. are going to have a little moment for a second. If you hear any moaning, it's not me, I swear. <laughs> I, I was like, that's an unusual, okay. Let them have their phone. The um, podcast has taken yes, a turn. <laughs> it's, it's called The Number with Darren Kennedy, and it's a very simple premise. It's all about the numbers of your life. And, it, you know, people automatically sometimes will jump to numerology. It's not about numerology. It really is. You know, it's asking the, the the basic question, really, or the fundamental question of can a life be measured in numbers? And if you think about our life, we measure everything. We measure steps. We measure calories. We measure bank balances. We measure, you know, dates that we fell in love. We, you know, phone numbers, the bus that you got when you were going to your first job interview, the number, all these things, numbers creep up in every aspect of our life. And, and it's really, you know, I think the beauty of the podcast is its simplicity. It's um, deceptively simple for both the interviewee and the listener. And it's just a nice conduit into people's lives. Where did the and concept really come from? Um, it came from my little brain. Uh, I had been, I, as I told you before, I started in radio. You know, when I was 17, 18, I did a radio show on local radio in Dublin called Dublin City FM. And I used to record it every week on my mini disc. And I used to have to deliver my mini disc to the radio station before Wednesday midday. And some days it was so tight because I'd be struggling to, you know, whatever. And I had no editing facilities. And it was the best training ground because I would sit down with my interviewee face to face, wherever we were in the world. And I would have my little notes 
And I would say, okay, when I press record, we're now going live because I'd no facilities to edit. And um, and ever since that, and then I did a lot of radio over the years. So I was kind of reluctant to do a podcast for the I didn't want to do it for the sake of doing it. Um, and my, you know, my background's in developing as well. You know, when I work in TV, you're constantly developing ideas. And I I kind of knew if I didn't do something that I was very interested in, I wouldn't stick with it. Um, and so that's ultimately where it came from. And I was playing with the idea of turning 40 and talking a bit about people about turning 40 and what that means. And then I felt very limited because, you know, people would be like, well, I'm not 40 or I'm 50 or whatever. So it kind of it kind of evolved from that. So super simple, seven questions about seven different aspects of your life and the numbers that are important to you. I love the whole concept and I've listened to uh, almost every episode. It's It's been really great. Oh, thank you so much. We yeah. said that. Tell me about coming out. How did that um, happen? Did that happen in Ireland? Were you, how old were you? Yes. Yeah, I was, I started coming out when I was 15, 16. Um, and it was, you know, as much as the world has changed, I still think coming out for a lot of people is very, very difficult. Um, I because, agree. you know, especially, I know we've the internet and you can see far off places and, you're, our worlds are still small, especially when you're that age and, you know, you, you live at home, you know, your source of money is most likely from your family or your caretakers. You know, it's you, you can feel trapped if you're not comfortable. Anyway, I was growing up in Dublin and um, I'm very lucky to have a very loving family. But even then, I didn't know how they were going to respond. And ultimately, the you know, I, one thing about me is I can't. I'm a very bad liar. I'm, you know, and someone said this to me recently, and it can be seen as a good thing or a bad thing, but I am honest to a fault. Um, and the earth, you know, I couldn't suppress it anymore. So I eventually came out and, you know, a lot of people relate to that and you do it in your own time. And um, I came out to my parents. I remember it vividly. I, cause I was studying in France at the time and I came home and I told them one weekend and it was tough. It was tough. It was, you know, it took a couple of years for them to really come around. They're the greatest LGBT advocates you can imagine. And, you know, they're, they're, they're great people and they understand like anyone who maybe wasn't sure or who didn't have, you know, didn't know a gay person. There's a lot of fear built up around that and a lot of unknowns. And then you realize, oh, my God, well, you know, Darren's still the same person. You know, he's if, if anything, we're getting more of him now. And it's it's good. And I think that's what that's that's a sign of good people it is do you feel a responsibility now that you're you're in the public eye do you feel a responsibility to carry that flag and and be a positive I no i don't feel a responsibility in the sense that i always just want to do what feels right to me i'm i you know i never intend to do any sort of activism per se i have been very vocal about different things over the years but again that's coming from a place of uh what i feel is is right and wrong and it's kind of justice um and one of my favorite words in the english language is courage or courageous and it comes from the latin word cur, the, the root of the word and it's really just to follow one's heart or to speak one's heart and i think if if we all can do that in whatever capacity that relates to you in your daily life i think the world would be a better place and it's just it's kind of like doing what's right and wrong and sometimes you know I think the word courageous has lost some of its its meaning. You know, when we talk about courageous now, it's like people going to battle and it doesn't have to be about that. It can just be simple things. And I, I always think if you, you know, if you spot an injustice and it's not about being a warrior either, because there is a thin line, you have to look after yourself. But just like, we all know what's right or wrong, you know? So just, that's it. And if everyone just tried to, and don't get me wrong, sometimes I get it wrong as well. Like it's not about being a Puritan. But I think, you know, ultimately that's kind of what guides me. It's my compass in life. And um, and sometimes it gets me in trouble, but that is what it is. Yeah. I have a friend, I've said it before. She said to me, I don't care if you're white, black, brown, green, just don't be an asshole. Exactly. Totally. <laughs> and totally I swear agree. by that. Yeah. Don't be an asshole. That's it. <laughs> it's like, it's, you, don't, you don't have to complicate it. Exactly. I've, I've seen on your social media that you said that one day there was a homophobic attack 
Yeah, now, you know, I wasn't, thankfully, I wasn't attacked uh, in, because I ran away. Um, but yeah, I was like, it was a, a potential aggressive mugging would probably be, but it was homophobic uh, sure. orientated. And it wasn't too long ago, actually. It, it was on this, believe it or not, it was, it was on the streets of Dublin. And I had just been home for a few weeks. And Dublin is one of the safest cities I've ever been in. I was so shocked. But um, listen, it just goes to show when you're in a city, you just have to have your wits about you. And I was coming home one night and noticed this this man basically coming behind me. And all of a sudden he, you know, um, confronted us and, and said, you know, give us everything you have. And basically I ran away. Um, that's kind of the very quick version of the story. Um, but yeah, I think just, you know, I was in Mexico City recently. It's one of the most dangerous cities in the world, but I had a great time and felt totally safe. So it's it, it's just, you know, it is what it is. I think there's, there's, you know, people who are down and out in their luck who can sometimes be opportunistic and um, you have to watch your back. Yeah, and uh, and talking about coming out and how I how we both agreed that it's uh it's still a difficult thing i find there's there's little snippets that happen in life even now in my 40s i'll hear a comment that just takes me back to that time that i was in the closet if you want to use that word and it brought you all that stress back and i feel like sometimes i i hear comments and i just it brings me back to those moments yeah absolutely you know and no matter you know how how far you've progressed in yourself. I mean, I'm the same and I'm very comfortable in my own skin. It's taken a lot of time and a lot of work and, you know, it's, it's, it's a process and we're, I will, at least I feel like I'm constantly learning and learning new things about myself and the world. And I think um, there are little things and I've had moments exactly as you describe where something will happen or someone will say something. And for a millisecond, it brings, you know, brings you back to that place. For me, it was a place of shame. I was ashamed of who I was and, ashamed that I didn't fit in ashamed that I wasn't like everyone else and you know obviously I understand that's that's not the case but in those little microaggressions it can it can zap you back um so yeah that's why you know and I it's but that being said you know I have young nieces and nephews and I hear how they talk and how they stand up for difference and how they you know and it is amazing because they're only kids but it is slowly maturely kind of being eroded which is uh, generationally which is uh, very inspiring it is it blows my mind with my nieces because they're being brought up to know no difference and I just kept thinking what a difference it is just from my generation to theirs and it's such a positive thing it's hugely positive it is touching on this I recently did a podcast for international men's day and the big question that I posed to the men on the panel were what does being a man mean to you so let me ask you, what does being a man mean to you, Darren? I think being a man means, to me anyway, means being honest, being vulnerable, being soft, being sometimes feminine. But more importantly, yeah, I think tenderness is a word that springs to mind. And I think that's something that I, when I was growing up, I probably wouldn't have said, you know, I would have been leaned much more into, you know, strength and protection and all those things, which I still think is part of being a man, but I think it's part of being human and of being loving, you know? So, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of what it means to me. It's a deep question. Oh my what gosh. does it mean to you? No one's turned that question around for me before. Although I find it very interesting that when people answer the question, no matter what their background is, they always say that it's a good vibe between a masculine and feminine. But I think maybe the question should say, what does being a good human mean? Or I think maybe we should change mm -hmm. the word to human. And I find it was quite interesting because the men on the panel were also very confused as to how men should act today with chivalry? Should they open a door for a woman with women's rights? Uh, should they, should they pay the bill? Should like, they're all- well, I believe confused. you should, no, I, I believe you should open the door for a woman or for a man. Um, and actually that's one, one observation I have here spending a lot of time in the US at the moment is, um, uh, especially at the gym, if someone's coming behind me, I will hold the door open for them. 
And nine times out of 10, I've noticed people here won't even look up from their phone and they will just march ahead. They won't acknowledge that you've held the door open for them. They won't. Yeah. And it's quite funny because I remember at first I was like, that was really annoying me. I'm like, that's so rude. That's so, and I'm like, no, do you know what? Let them do like, I'm not going to change how I behave. And it's just a cultural thing or I don't know what it is, but it's like, yeah, I'd hold the door open for if there's someone come behind me. It doesn't have to be a man or a woman. Just like, you know, be an it's asshole. nice if someone does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> same thing. Same thing. Where does your body confidence come from? If if people follow you on social media, the first thing they'll see is maybe you in your underwear, you in a speedo, um, you changing. Um, where does that confidence come from? I don't know if I could do that. For a long time, I didn't have body confidence. I was terribly, I was racked with insecurity and all sorts of things when I was growing up as a teenager. Um, really was, because uh, I was never particularly... I wasn't into team sports. So I'd had a really awful experience when I was like five or six years old when this soccer coach really wanted me to join this football team. I had no interest. And then he screamed at me the whole time I was there. It was awful. And it really gave me PTSD. And it's funny because I remember he kept screaming at me to run, to run, to run. Do you ever run in cold weather and get a sore, burny kind of troth when you're out of breath? So I remember I was literally, I must have been five or six and his son was a guy called Daniel was in my class and Daniel was an excellent footballer and I was kind of you know tall and kind of stocky for my age and me and Daniel were the same roughly the same physicality so he was assuming because Daniel's a great footballer that I'm going to be a great footballer and he screamed at me and I remember running so hard that I got this burny feeling in my throat and anytime I get that now as an adult which is rare it literally brings me back to that moment. And um, so for a long time, I didn't, that turned me off team sports. I really did. I, I was like, I didn't like it. And I liked individual sports, you know, ish, like, at, you know, all these, like I did a bit of kickboxing and. There's Toby. He's my rescue dog. And he's. Uh, hello, Toby. <laughs> Gorgeous. And then um, we've got Penelope. Oh my God. So cute. <laughs> Oh, they're gorgeous. They're beautiful. In a nutshell, I never, it was not something that I, I've naturally had. And I just, you know, as gone on, I'm like, you know what, this is, this is, uh, keeping fit is something that's just part of my lifestyle. It's something that is good for me um, physically, mentally, you know, emotionally, all those things. And um, I'm just going to like, feck it. Do you, you feel like I mean? the older you get, the more confident you get? Yeah, I think, yes is it confidence or do you yeah i'm just kind of like you know this is it this is like life is now so feck it but sometimes they don't get me wrong like it, it takes a while like i didn't do that initially i think you slowly build up that kind of confidence but also i'm not doing it for that reason does that make sense yeah and no it goes with your whole brand but your confidence does show through which which is a compliment Thank you. And, you know, I will say there are times where I still feel very insecure in my body. But that's that's OK. That's OK. And that's what I say to someone. It's like even if I'm working with someone and they wear, you know, I'm saying, oh, well, why don't you try and wear this? And they're like, oh, my God, I could never wear that. I don't feel confident with that. I'm like, OK, that's OK. But like it's, you know, confidence doesn't happen overnight. It's like if you feel uncomfortable wearing a wide leg trouser, but you want to wear them, well, break them in, wear them for a few minutes every day around the house and see how you feel. And if at the end of a week or whatever, you're not into them, don't wear them. You don't have to do it. So the same applies to, you know, if you're wearing a Speedo uh, around the pool, I'm you might feel insecure. And I'm like, you know what? After a while, it just, yeah. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do, basically. Exactly. Your Instagram followers. So you managed to keep a great following. And how do you manage to keep up with social media because social media is a lot. And I find that it's a fascinating subject because everybody has a different answer to this. First and foremost, social media for me is part of business um, and it's part of work. Uh, so I don't, but at the same time, I don't overly orchestrate things. I don't overly plan things. I go at what feels right in the moment. There are times where I'll just be like, you know what? I don't want to, I don't want to look at Instagram for the next few days. So I just won't. And there are times when I'm like, oh my God, I want to share this. This is fun or this is useful or someone might find this informative or helpful or, or whatever. So I don't, I try not to give it too much weight. Something I've been doing, 
which I've been trying to get back into the habit of doing this year, we're only a week or two in, <laughs> is I try not to look at Instagram for at least an hour after I've woken up. Sure. Because it's too easy to wake up and look at it away, and then all of a sudden you're you know, you're, you, you're gone down this rabbit hole. And I don't, ne- I don't think it's the best thing for you to start your day no. because you can end up reading, things. you know, it's very easy to get space, a comparison on Instagram, all that stuff. I really try and keep a healthy distance. So I talk to a lot of people who actually have people who do their social media. And I find that for me, it would be a control thing that I would just feel that I would want to have my hand in that all the time. Then I'm trying to explain to someone what I want. Yeah. And I do it when it works and I yeah. don't, you know, it's, Basically, yeah, it, don't like, and I don't want to diminish it, but it, it's a part of work and it's a part of life, but it's not, the, you know, what drives. I'm not living my life through an Instagram lens, which I, some people can fall into that trap. Yeah. Of. Let's talk about, since we have barking dogs. You'll know that a lot of my content is dogs. So <laughs> it's all good in my Let's talk yeah. about Harry, because I love um, your posts about Harry. And, um, I I just wanted to bring him up into this conversation as oh, my little you. dog is barking. Yeah, well, for anyone who, who doesn't know who Harry is, Harry was my constant companion for almost 17 years, a tiny teacup Yorkshire Terrier, and he will be, he, his year anniversary will be next week. Aww. And he was just a constant joy. And I think, you know, you as a fellow dog lover will know that the... Just that unconditional friendship that a dog brings. And I really, really miss him. And I really miss having a dog in my life. And it's my first time kind of ever not having a dog. I like I grew up in a house. We always had dogs. We um, And I said earlier on that I was fascinated. I wanted to be a veterinarian. I was fascinated with animals. And I still am. And my parents were great. And they allowed me to a certain extent, you know, turn our house into a menagerie when I was growing up. I had my first job when I was 13. I've never not had a job all throughout school, all throughout college. And it gave me a great sense of independence. And every Thursday when I got paid, I worked in a petrol station, a gas station. The first thing I do is go to the pet store and I would buy new fish in my aquarium or I'd buy turtles or I'd buy plants to put in my aquarium or I'd buy birds or, you know, so I've always loved animals, but dogs were always kind of the, the thing that I bonded with, you know, and I think feeling very different and like I didn't belong oftentimes as a teenager my dogs were always a uh, uh, they're always my number one so uh yeah I miss Harry miss him so much how did you grieve did I I lost my Yorkie uh two years ago and so we when we lost Bruno I always tell people that I felt it was more of a loss than some people I've known and um, I cried my eyes out cried my eyes it was very very difficult and you know like when Annie lost and I think ultimately I had to lean into the beautiful life and adventure that he had and the joy that he brought me rather than you know focusing on the fact that he was no longer with me um yeah leaning into leaning into that it was it was a journey for us definitely and it was our first pet I just I found it very difficult we had a we had birthday parties for him during his year. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're the gays in the community. So we would always have the big um, summer barbecues, which were Bruno's birthdays. And then when he died, it was just fitting to have a funeral for Bruno. And so people came oh. and we had a large funeral, uh, probably better than some people have. I felt that that's what helped me get through it. I don't know yeah. if how you... How you felt after you lost Harry? Did you do anything special for him? Not in not in a ceremony style way, but in my own way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, look, you're getting kids. <laughs> she's uh, she's yeah, she's one of a kind. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> chocolate or vanilla? Oh, chocolate. That was quick. <laughs> I don't. I don't really like vanilla. I love chocolate. I love the smell of vanilla. Hmm. <laughs> okay moving on what is the last thing you've searched for on the internet oh my god i think i was i i go down these rabbit holes and i went into a deep dive into zorro you know zorro yeah like mexico so 
long story short, I discovered on my trip to Mexico, I don't know how I went in this rabbit hole, Zorro, and the legend of Zorro is based on an Irishman with red hair from County Wexford who emigrated to Mexico in 1630 or thereabouts. I'm going to leave that little cherry there. You can have a Google. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Do you have an interest in gardening or farming? Gardening. Gardening. You're I love, not out I there love with plants. the transfers. No, but I love plants and I love, um, I've always loved plants. Again, it's tied back to that love of nature and wildlife. And, yeah. What's the strangest talent you have? I can flare in my nostrils. There you go. <laughs> That's your party <laughs> trick. Describe yourself in three words. Tenacious, loyal, and loving. Lovely. Do you sing in the shower? No, I try not to sing full stop. I have an awful singing voice and I don't think anyone needs to hear it. <laughs> Me included. Last live gig you've been to? Oh, I went to see Hosier in the Hollywood Bowl. It was amazing. Yeah, amazing. it was so good. What is the most precious thing you own? Hmm. You know, I'm not really attached to things. Um, and I, I'm not incredibly materialistic at all. And I would say... You know, I would have said my, like my, my dog, obviously I don't have one at the moment. Um, probably my passport. Good answer. Yeah. Favorite smell. Um, I like anything with a lime and citrus note, like in terms of fragrance. And then I love it, like a gin and tonic with lime um, or a margarita. Yeah. So lime citrusy. And also as well, I just think it's so fresh and it reminds me of, summertime and lying on a beach and just you know brightness first crush celebrity first crush probably brad pitt <laughs> or robbie williams when he was in take that yeah Ooh. robbie williams and yeah biggest fear hmm my biggest fear i i don't know what my biggest fear is i mean i have many fears i guess like everyone Try not to let them just, you know, I get, I'm mildly claustrophobic. So if, if my arms are restricted, it freaks me out. So psychologically, that's a really big th fear for me. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Most important life lesson so far. Don't be an asshole. Love it. Strangest thing in your closet. Strangest thing. Yeah. Um. God, I was actually just unpacking my suitcase this morning. Um, I mean, strange? I don't know if I have anything strange. I mean, I have items that I will wear maybe once in a blue moon, but I wouldn't call them strange. Do you have any uh, scars or birthmarks? Yeah, I do have scars. Yeah, I have a scar on my wrist, which freaks people out right there just before my, my vein. I had an accident when I was a kid with my cousin. We were playing near broken glass and I almost, I did slip my wrists. So yeah, I think sometimes if people get a glance at that, it can look like, oh. I'm like, oh, no. So yeah. <laughs> Have you ever been skydiving? No, and no interest. No. Are you scared of heights? No. I just don't want to throw myself out of a plane. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite way to relax? listening to music and just lying on the sofa, put my headphones in and I have a particular soundtrack called Beautiful Songs. And I love just to switch off and like almost fall asleep, but I don't fall asleep. So I guess it's semi-meditative state, but like I just switch off, it's lovely. Do you read books? Not really. Um, I, I go through waves. I haven't, I haven't read a book probably in about two years. I carry them around with me. At one stage, I had seven books. And I was like, why am I carrying Like, I'm not reading them. But then I will every now and again pick up a book and devour it. The last thing you, you binged watched? Um, I think it was The House of Usher. Oh, yes. On Netflix. So good. And then also, what else? There was something else I watched. I was watching The Crown. No, The House of Usher. Yeah. Favorite color of the season? My favorite color full stop is green and blue and purple and orange. I just love color. <laughs> What's your favorite number? Seven. Why is that? 
you know, growing up as a kid, I always thought seven was my lucky number. And then I realized as when I started doing the number podcast and reflecting on my numbers, I realized that my life has gone in cycles of seven. So every seven years, it feels like a new beginning, a new stage, a new, uh, and you know, yeah, a new chapter of life, which is quite interesting. What does the word friendship mean to you? Friendship means lots of things to me. I think it means... Um, being there for someone and then being there for you. I take my, I invest heavily in my friendships um, and I always have done. And most of my friends are f- people that have been in my life for 30 years. And um, yeah, I take friendship. Um, I really value my friendships. So I think life would be very difficult without them. What does 2024 have in store for you? Who the hell knows? That's the exciting <laughs> part. There's lots of things that I would like to achieve and, you know, I, I, happiness and joy. That's, you know, once I, once I have that, I can figure out the rest. Lovely. Thank you very much, Darren, for this lovely chat. My absolute pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. And thanks for uh, interviewing me to the pooches.